Right, so I was going through a closet full of old tech products and I found this guy, the original iPhone SE. And this phone is quite special for me because it did start my love for iOS. This was one of the first iPhones I ever used, but also this was featured in one of my first non-leak videos I did on this channel. I believe it was about this device on iOS 14. And so I thought, hey, why not revisit this now that's lost support and it's become super cheap. Should you still consider this as a secondary or backup iPhone? And how is it performing on its last version of iOS? Well, spoiler alert, surprisingly good, but let's delve into my full thoughts. So let's begin with the design and this by far is the standout feature with the SE because it is a truly compact device. It's one of the last modern iPhones to be based on the older iPhone 5 body that of course is four inches. And that pales in comparison to the ginormous 14 Pro Max I have right now, but I can't lie guys. I think the flat edges for this compact size definitely makes more sense because I often find myself hating the flat sides on the 14 Pro Max and couple that with the heft of the device and yeah, this is not a very comfortable device compared to the OG SE. And yes, I can understand why Steve Jobs loved the iPhone being this compact, because it is easy reaching all corners of the device, and it's a very comfortable phone. And I can't lie guys, because the iPhone 14 does have flat sides, this design does not feel that old, which I know is surprising because it's based on the iPhone 5 which came out back in 2012, but this design still feels pretty fresh. And yeah, it's a modern classic. Now let's move on to the display on this. CS compared to my 14 Pro Max, the panel on this is not that great. It's four inches to begin with, but also the resolution is 1136 by 640, which does pale in comparison to the Quad HD panel on the 14 Pro Max. You also get 60 Hertz. And yeah, this is obviously a much inferior experience to current iPhones. This also only has 500 nits of brightness, and so yes, compared to newer iPhones, this is not that great on paper. However, using the display in person, guys, I'll be honest, it's still actually pretty good. Remember, this is a retina panel, so for its size, the resolution's completely fine. And yeah, the viewing angles are pretty good. The colors are decent enough. And yeah, I did not hate the display on this. And I guess that's a testament to how good Apple's LCDs are because they were using these for years before switching to OLED with the iPhone 10. I will say though, the brightness is by far the worst thing about this device. 500 nits for a mobile device is simply not enough when outdoors. And so I do appreciate we get 2000 nits with the 14 Pro Max outdoors. But again, display quality wise, the iPhone SE is still pretty decent. And for those who hate the bezels on the SE, I'll be honest, I could care less about this. I can easily overlook this. And actually when playing games and watching video and landscape, you can place your thumb on the bezels when holding the device. So yeah, the bezels aren't completely useless. Also want to mention rose gold might not be my favorite color, but I do kind of miss this. Apple should bring this color back with future iPhones. And by the way, would like to remind you guys, like this video and subscribe for more content like this. It would be appreciated. So let's now talk about the performance with the OG SE. So this has the A9 chip and I believe two gigs of RAM. And yes, I know now we're on the A16 chip, but again, surprisingly, the SE is not that bad. Now, of course, it does lag occasionally, but I'll be honest, it's still very usable, which is surprising to me because this is a device that came out seven years ago. So the fact you can still make do with this is very surprising. And by the way, I did kind of push this and played some games on it. And for the most part, it was pretty good. I will say there was some overheating and it did get pretty warm, but otherwise it was still playable, which again was very surprising for me. Now I do want to mention that because there is no newer engine in this, this phone actually lacks a lot of the big features iOS 15 introduced. For example, portrait mode on FaceTime, live text, on-device speech processing, and many other features are list for you guys. And that does conveniently bring me onto software because yes, the iOS 15 experience is pretty bare bones on this, but honestly, compared to how buggy iOS 16 has been on the 14 Pro Max, it's kind of refreshing how stable iOS 15 is on the device. And I believe Apple is still releasing new versions of iOS 15, so this device should remain stable for the most part for the next few years. And yeah, honestly, I'm kind of glad they did end support with iOS 15 on the SE because in the past, 
they have pushed older devices and given them more updates than they should have, resulting in these devices lagging and crashing all the time. But that's thankfully not the case with the SE. This does still run very well for the most part. Now the cameras on the SC really made me appreciate how good the 14 Pro Max is because while this is decent, it definitely does lag way behind newer iPhones. So for those wondering, we have a 12 megapixel camera on the back and a 1.2 megapixel camera on the front. And surprisingly, that front camera actually isn't all too bad. However, I will say usually the background's completely overexposed and it creates this weird effect, but my face is actually pretty well lit. And again, with the rear camera, if you do give it enough light, it does produce pretty decent shots, but if you do have less light available, it does struggle a lot. And that's because the sensor's pretty tiny on this and the aperture is not that great. And you don't have Smart HDR here, which I guess some might appreciate. I know some don't like the over-processed look. Smart HDR can sometimes produce. And so you don't get that with the SE. This does produce exactly what the camera sees without any enhancements. And so I guess some may appreciate that. Actually, I was completely wrong. There is a basic version of HD on this phone and it does slightly improve the picture, but again, not as good as Smart HDR. Now, surprisingly, and I completely forgot about this, this does actually have 4K video support, which is kind of crazy because a device that came out seven years ago and it being this compact can still record 4K video. And it's not that great to be honest, but the fact it can do it for such an old device that's pretty amazing. But let's be honest guys, I should not be surprised this phone is much better than this phone and it's kind of amazing to see how far we've come and the advancements Apple's made with the camera tech on the iPhone. And that includes the features as well because this has no portrait modes, this has no portrait lighting, no night modes, no cinematic modes. It gives you the bare essentials of the camera experience and that's about it. But overall guys, for a device that's this old, the camera has surprisingly been decent. However, now we get to the big issue with the SE that plagued at launch and is much worse now after years of use. And that of course is the battery life. So this being a tiny device means you have a pretty small battery inside. The iPhone 5 and 5S were not known for having amazing battery life. And so yes, years after use, the SE is pretty bad when it comes to battery life. And this really pushes the limits of how bad the battery life could be because when I was testing the cameras on this, simply using this for five minutes makes the battery drop by 10 to 15%. And so if I wanted to use the cameras for a long period of time, I needed a power bank for the device. Otherwise it would not last throughout the day. And the same goes for gaming on this. And even sometimes scrolling on Twitter, I can see the battery life draining super fast. And yeah, when the battery starts to run low, the phone does lag and also overheats. And so yeah, this by far is the biggest issue with the SE. The battery life is simply terrible. Now, to be fair, for those interested in buying this, you're likely not going to use this as your main device. And so the one or two hours of screen time you get could be enough for basic usage. But yes, I do wish we had better battery life in this. And I know I can replace the battery in this, but it's simply not worth the cost because the device itself is pretty old. It's lost support. And so spending $50 on this to replace the battery would not make sense. And to be fair, even if I replace the battery, I doubt the battery life is going to be that much better. The SE1 was plagued with pretty bad battery life at launch. And so yeah, that's the Achilles heel with this device. Apart from that, it's aged pretty good. I mean, for example, the lack of 5G in this is a non-issue because it still has 4G supports and that's still widely supported in many countries. And so that's a non-issue. And also Touch ID is still ever reliable. Now I do prefer Face ID, it's more seamless and you don't have to think about it, it just works. Whereas here you do have to press a button on the device but Touch ID is super reliable. And by the way, this was one of the last iPhones to have an actual physical home button because remember the iPhone 7 onwards had a haptic home button for better water resistance. And while I'm fine with the haptics on the iPhone 7, I do prefer this physical home button. Also, I know this probably has a super old version of Bluetooth. I'll put it up on the screen right now, but connectivity wise, I've had no issues. AirPods Pro 2 still connect to these. And so yes, you could actually use this as a cellular iPod 
for runs because this is a much lighter device than most new iPhones. And also remember, it's one of the last iPhones with a headphone jack. And so if you do prefer to use wide headphones, this could be a decent cellular iPod. And yes, you could just get a cellular Apple Watch, but not all carriers support the Apple Watch whereas you can put cheap SIM in this device and use it immediately. So I can see the purpose for this as a backup iPhone in 2023. Finally, thought I'd mention some other things I noticed. The first thing being the speakers, the pretty bad. I'm definitely glad with the iPhone 7 onwards, Apple has been giving us stereo speakers and also random tidbit, but I do want to mention this is the first and only iPhone SE model to have SE engraved on the back. I do kind of wish we had this still on the SE because it's a nice touch and it would differentiate the SE from older iPhones, but for some reason Apple got rid of it. And finally, I do want to mention this is one of the last iPhones to be released with a flush camera module, which I'm pretty jelly about because compared to the 14 Pro Max, it looks so clean on the back. And also, I do appreciate Apple always giving us the best materials for their devices. Since the phone has aged incredibly because aluminium super durable, I've dropped this phone a few times and there are a few nicks, but it's still in pretty good condition. And actually, I'm very glad the SE got rid of the chamfered edges that were present with the iPhone 5 and 5S. Those aged pretty badly, so the lack of that on the SE is appreciated. And finally, it's kind of funny, the 14 Pro Max, a £1,200 device, has the same ports as this iPhone from years ago. So yes, I'm glad we're finally switching to Type-C with the 15 series. Anyways, that's about it for my thoughts on this device. It was fun looking back on this, and honestly, as a backup or secondary device, this actually does make sense. It's a pretty cheap device, but also the design is iconic, and so having this in your collection is kind of worth it. Anyways, that's about it, guys. Tell me your thoughts regarding the OG SE in the comments. Anyways, thank you for watching, guys. Make sure to like and subscribe for the latest Apple news and rumors. And on that note, I'll see you guys in the next one.